text. And if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to go to a couple of different passages. One is uh, we want to start in 1 John, uh, probably a verse that you've memorized somewhere along the way. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And then we're also going to actually uh, use as sort of our foundation uh, Psalm 51, Psalm 51 uh, with David's account and, uh, of what actually went on and transpired in that whole uh, adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. So we're going to start in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and, and then here's what the scripture says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if you would, go left. Go back over into the Old Testament into Psalm chapter 51. And let's look at the story of David and his whole uh, struggle with uh, the event of Bathsheba. So verse 1 of chapter 51 says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your desire, uh, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the inner part, hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones, uh, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my transgressions, uh, all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. So Jim Baker, I've shared before, really achieved the American dream and even more. He became the, the leader of the multi-million dollar PTL club, Heritage USA. He was a proponent, you may remember, in those days of the prosperity gospel. And he preached this upbeat message of optimism and health and wealth and all of those things that would certainly make you and me feel good. But in 1987, that whole world came crashing down around him when his encounters with Jessica Hahn became national news and he was convicted of mail fraud not too long after that wire fraud sentenced to 45 years in federal penitentiary he was released after five years but in an interview with a magazine called servant magazine not too long after he was released he was asked what he had learned during his time in prison and he said he learned a lot and one of those things he said he learned was that his previous philosophy of life had been all flawed had been wrong he said i learned that the prosperity gospel doesn't work all that well in prison and, uh, and so he said, I was gravely wrong. And he said, I'm so grateful that God did not strike me dead for being a false prophet. And not too long after that, he actually wrote a book, which I've referenced before. And it was called, um, I Was Wrong. Three words. I was wrong. Now, the question I want to sort of bump off of that uh, intro is this. So how many times in your life have you been wrong? How many times in your life have you let somebody down or have you made a bad decision or, or maybe you've said or, or done something that hurt somebody you loved or maybe you just turned back on God in some way and you, and you did things your own way? How many times in life did you just mess up and blow it nine ways to sundown? Now, here's a question. What would you be? If you had not been given the grace of forgiveness, what would life like be like for you if you had never, ever been given a way out of your mess? 
some years ago, in fact, many, many years ago, I read a book called I Heard the Owl Call My Name. And that book was about an Anglican vicar, an Anglican priest that had gone into a Native American village, and this was years ago, and they were obviously a remote village, uh, didn't speak uh, a language that very few many people knew and so he went into this and he got to know those people and he began to love those people and so on spent a lot of time with them but he quickly discovered that they had no word in their language for thank you now what if in the face of our sin there was no word there was no way to make your wrong right think about that what if there was no way to correct your errors? What if you could not navigate your way back to uh, anything that was really any semblance of decency or moral good? Yeah, I remember as a boy going into one of those country fairs, and they had one of those sort of double-wide trailers that was full of those mirrors that would absolutely confuse you, and you had to navigate your way through these mirrors to get out. I got lost as a goose in a snowstorm. I couldn't get out. I panicked. I didn't know how to get out. I just had to call somebody to come find me. Finally, one of the workers came to give I couldn't figure out how you get through these mirrors. And, and, and when you think about your life and the mess-ups of your life, what would it be like if you could not navigate through those and there was no way? Well, here's the good news of the gospel. And the good news of a relationship with God is that there is always a way out. There is always a way back. There is always a way out of the far country if you've become that prodigal. If you've become that one that's sort of traveled on your own way and done your own thing and you've gone off into the far country to live and according to the way you wanted to live, there is a way out of the far country. There, there is a way out if you're like Adam and Eve and you're back there on the back side of that bush hiding out from God because you know that you've sinned. You know that you've violated the standard of God. You've done something opposed to God. And so you're hiding out on the back side of that bush. There is a way out from behind that bush. Or, or maybe you're like Peter and, and you, you blew it nine ways to sundown and you let the Lord Jesus down. You drifted away. You moved away. You did your thing. And, and you just messed up. And, and now you're all knotted up in your old nets, just like Peter, who went back to his nets, because that's all he knew. And yet he was broken, and he was messed up inside because of the mess up of his life. And if you're like Peter, knotted up by your old nets, and you've messed up, there is a way back. There is a way out. And that's the good news of the gospel. There is always that land of beginning again. There is a way that you can come back to God no matter how far away you've traveled. And the Bible says that way is always through the process of the confession and repentance of our sin, of dealing with our sin. You see, the bottom line is that confession and repentance is sort of just an expression of the grace of God. It is God's grace to us, his grace path to us that says this is your way. This is your opportunity to say I was wrong. Over the last couple of Sundays we've been talking about this thing of experiencing intimacy with God. And we said that there are some expectations, if you will, that we might come into this thing of, 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 building, our expectation, uh, of our building our intimacy with God and and, and we said basically that it's not about becoming a buddy pal with God. It's not about reducing God down to your buddy pal level so that he just accepts whatever you do. He just kind of condones it, looks at it, and smiles upon it and just says, here's grace for everything you do. No, he, it, it's not about becoming a buddy pal with God. It's not about manipulating God in some way to make him like you more than he already does. Intimacy with God, we said, is simply about living with deeply with this uh, consciousness this connection to God that's a day-to-day -day basis, that's an everyday process where you are daily connected with him, interacting with him, walking with him, talking with him, and you enjoy this sweet fellowship with him. That kind of intimacy is what we're talking about. And we said that the truth of the matter is that every person in this building, every day of life is as close to God as we've chosen to be. It just is, is just at that place, you, you, you can't say it's about somebody else. You have to start with you and say, I'm as close to God right now as I have chosen to be. And then last week we said 
hey, if you're not careful, there is a danger of drifting away from God. There is this danger of slipping away from God and losing that sense of closeness and that connection to him on a daily basis. That's why Swindoll said on one occasion, he said, nobody can do anything about the dilemma but you. So if you're not careful, you get yourself in a mess. You slip away. You become the prodigal. You become the Adam and Eve. You become the Peter. And in doing that, nobody can do anything about that dilemma but you. And so there is the danger of drifting. And remember, God doesn't move. It's us that moves. God doesn't drift, we do. And there's no way to really enjoy intimacy with God if we allow that kind of sin or that kind of distance, that chasm that's created between us to continue between us and God. And so the Bible's answer is that we must confess our sins to God. Repent of that, turn away from that, and turn toward him. Repent and come back to God that you might enjoy the joy of your salvation. That's what went on here in Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51 is really the record of a man who knows that he's messed up in life. It's the record of a man who knew that he had drifted away from God, who got away from God, who made the wrong decisions in his life. Now, you know the story. Bathsheba, he saw one night showering, and he looked at her, and then he began to long for her, and then all of a sudden he laid hold of her, and he committed the sin of adultery. And if that wasn't enough, He tried to hide his sin by arranging to have her husband put on the front lines of battle so that he would be killed, and then he wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. Then, for a year, you remember what he tried to do? He tried to cover that sin up, and he tried to to hide it so that nobody else would know about it, and hopefully God wouldn't find out about it, and God wouldn't kill him. But you remember David's description of himself for that entire year while he tried to hide that sin of adultery with Bathsheba. You remember what he did? You remember how he described it? He said, my bones waxed old within me. He said, day and night, the Lord's hand was heavy upon me. He said, my moisture became like the drought of summer. In other words, physically, his spiritual shenanigans that was going on was killing him. It was like a cancer. It was eating away at him. The sin of his life was eating away. He said, when I declared not my sin, my body was wasting away. And then even here in Psalm chapter 51, he says, my sin is ever before me. All he could see was his sin. Everywhere he looked, that's all he could think of. That's all he could see. That's all he could hear. I mean, he was was more than just a soldier. He was a singer. He was a songwriter. And every time he came in from the battlefield, he put his sword down and he'd pick up his harp and he'd listen to the choirs and the singers in the temple. But all that he could hear was the sorrow and sadness of his own life. The choir was always going to be off key. The the, the worship leader was always going to be out of tune. The preacher was never going to have a good sermon. Nothing he heard on the outside was ever going to be right because nothing on the inside of him was ever right. That's always the way it is. When sin is allowed to continue in your life, when sin is allowed to continue to move forward, when sin is allowed, when that distance and that separation between you and God is allowed to continue, it's always going to be that way. The good news is always going to be bad news, and the bad news is always going to be worse news, not because everything around you is bad, but rather because everything within you is wrong. And, and so David did what only we can do the only thing we can do when that kind of distance has come between us and God when guilt and shame and sin have robbed us of the joy of our salvation the ability to sleep at night no dose doesn't work anymore he took his guilt and he took his shame and he took his sins and he took those to God and guess what he got from God in return he got forgiveness forgiveness And if that's you this morning, and if it's you for whom life has become complicated and busy and distant from God, and somehow for some reason you've drifted away, you've let let sin rob you of your joy, and it's messed you up in life, here's the good news. Like David found that there is a way back to God, there's a way back for you. And it's through the forgiveness of God. How? How do you come back when you've drifted away from him? What does it take? 
Now, there's a couple of things that we can learn from this chapter. The first is this. One of the things that it's going to take, one of the things it's going to take is you've got to appeal to the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. No matter where you are, wherever you find yourself, you've got to appeal to the mercy and the grace of God. David prayed this. He said, have mercy. He said, be gracious to me, upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. You see, David wasn't in any kind of position to come to God and to say, hey, God, I demand that you give me grace. Hey, God, I demand that you forgive me of my sin. He wasn't in any position to do that. He certainly didn't want to deal with anything regarding the justice of Almighty God. You know, there's a big difference between mercy and justice. Mercy is when God doesn't give you what you do deserve. Justice is when you get exactly what you've earned. Exactly what's coming to you. And I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of like David. I could use the mercy of God, but I'm not all that much interested in the justice of God. The Bible says that if the Lord should mark our iniquities, and it's interesting, that word mark, if he should mark our iniquities, he says, who shall stand? And that word mark is really, it's an accounting term. And it really means to enter something onto a ledger every time it occurs. And so it's, it's the idea of recording something every time something occurs. So if God were to enter it against us every time we sin, and then he meted out a fair punishment for all of that sin, man alive, we'd be sunk right now. where We wouldn't be able to stand. Because what we need, ladies and gentlemen, is not the justice of Almighty God, what we need is the mercy of God when we pulled away from him. It's, it's like the woman I told you about a long time ago. She, she got her picture, and she was unhappy with the photographs that the photographer had taken her, and she said, man, a lot of these just don't do me justice. He said, ma'am, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> well, that's the way it is with all of us. None of us want to be dealt with in life according to our sins. We want to be we, we need to be dealt with by the mercy of God and the grace of God. And that's, that's why David said, according to thy loving kindness, here in verse 1, he said, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, your compassion. You see, what David was banking on, that it was going to be within the nature of God to show mercy, to not deal with us according to what we are, but according to who God is, to, according to who he is. God's nature is one who forgives. His nature is to love and to show grace and to show mercy. And so listen, if, if, if that's you today, here's, here's the message. If that's you today and you've drifted away from God and you've parted ways with God for some, whatever reason, you've let stuff get in your life and separate between you and God, if that's you and you've drifted away and, 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 and sin has made its mark on your life, then there's a way back. And that way back to that connection and that intimacy with God is through the grace and the mercy of God. Confess your sin, repenting of that sin, turning away from that, and appealing to God's grace and mercy, giving you what you do not deserve. Appeal to the mercy and the grace of God. A second thing that we can do to come back to God, a way back to God, is not only appeal to the mercy of God and the grace of God, but confess your sins before the face of God. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, we read this in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of how much? All unrighteousness. You see, God's made a way for us to close the gap He's made a way for us to be free from the guilt and the shame and the sin of our lives. And it's through, it's through what the Bible calls confession and repentance of sin. Now, when we do something good and we do something noble and we do something kind, let me tell you something, we are quick to claim credit. But when we do something wrong, most of us do what comes natural, and that is we try to sidestep the blame as quick as we can. And we try to excuse ourselves and accuse others. But you know what? There comes a time. When you've got to stop blaming your mama and your daddy and your, and your grandma and your great-grandpa, you've got to stop blaming the Democrats and the Republicans. You've got to stop blaming Satan. You've got to stop blaming your neighbor down the road. You've got to stop blaming the school system. You've got to stop blaming the preacher. Stop blaming the Sunday school. You've got to stop blaming everybody else, and you have to take responsibility for your sin. You own it. 
That's why Swindoll said nobody can do anything about your dilemma but you. And you got to take responsibility for it. You have to say, I was wrong. I sinned. I missed the mark. That's what confession means. Confession of sin is the word homo legeo. You hear same as. Homo legeo. Say the same thing as. That's where you come to say, God, I recognize what you've said. It is sin and I call it that in my life. That's what David finally came to do here in verses 3 through 5. He said, I know my transgression. He said, uh, he said man alive. My sin is always before me. Nobody has to remind me. Verse 4, he said, God, I have sinned. I've done what's wrong and evil in your sight. Sin is always, first and foremost, a a sin against God. It is is always first against him. And in verse 5, he even goes so far as to acknowledge, I've not only done wrong, he says, man alive, I am wrong. He goes back and he traces his actions all the way back to even his sinful nature that he was born with. Even before he came out of his mama's womb, he said, I was touched by that sinful nature. I mean, you see how honest David is being with God. He's just laying it all out before him, and he's not trying to hide anything. He's just calling it what it is. It's sin, and he says, I did it. I messed up. You see, that's what you got to do. you got to confess. you got to say the same thing as call it what it is and turn away from it and turn toward God. And that's the only way that you and I can ever really deal effectively with our sin. You can't rationalize it. You can't minimize it. You can't trivialize it. You, can, you can't repress it. You can't ignore it. You can't try to shove it back in the back of your brain and act like it never happened. Trying to forget your sin is, is like trying to forget you got a rock in your shoe. I mean, if you've ever had a pebble in your shoe, you know that the only thing you can think about until you get the pebble out of your shoe is that pebble in your shoe. And that's the way it is with the sin that's messing your life up and you feel awful. Some people try to cover their sin up. Some people try to escape their sin. Some people try to atone for their sins. They build hospitals because they they hit some kid somewhere. And so they they just want to make atonement for that. So they they give all these dollars to to do that as if that's going to atone for their sin. But I'm going to tell you, None of those efforts, none of those those activities that we do will ultimately work to remove the sin of your life. It's a knot that only God can ever untie. And so the answer to our guilt, the answer to our separation, the answer to our drifting away from God is always the same. We've got to go through his grace and his mercy and experience his forgiveness, and that's through confession and repentance of our sin. Confess your sins to God. Don't be like that little boy. Got home, got in a fight one day at school. Got home and his mama said to him, well, son, what in the world happened? He said, well, the trouble all started whenever that fella hit me back. Now, that's, that's not confession. That's weaseling out of your responsibility. So don't try to weasel out of your responsibility. Don't try to justify what you're doing. Instead, call it what it is. Acknowledge it. God, I made the wrong decisions. God, I chose to do all this stuff that caused me to drift. God, I'm the one who entered all this, and now I feel so busy, and I feel so slammed, and I don't have time for you. But I made the decisions, God. I messed up, and I've drifted, and I miss you. And so we've got to be careful. and We've got to watch what happens, because what God says to us and what God does is he comes along in our life, and he says, no, look. If you want to find your way back to me, if you want to come back to me, here's what what you've got to do. You've got to confess your sins before men. You've got to confess your sins before God. You've got to appeal to the mercy and the grace of God. You've got to confess your sins before the face of God. And then finally, You've got to avail yourself to the cleansing of God. Avail yourself to the cleansing of God. Verses 6 through 10. In the Old Testament, when the high priest would come in on the Day of Atonement, one day out of the year, Yom Kippur, he would come in and he would represent all of the people of Israel. And he would bring the blood of lambs and bulls and goats and sheep and, and all those kind of things. And he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle that blood of those bulls and those goats and so on. He would, he would sprinkle that blood on, on top of something called the mercy seat. 
Now, underneath the mercy seat was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were three things that were housed. There was Aaron's rod that budded. There was a pot of manna that had come from the wilderness. And then there was the law of God, the Ten Commandments, if you will. And that was inside the Ark of the Covenant. And so the symbolism was that when that, when that high priest would bring that blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, it acted as a covering for the sins of the people of Israel. Now here's my question. Would you rather have your sins covered or would you rather have your sins cleansed? Well, I'll take number two. But I remember, and I've told some of you before, in fact, it's become kind of a joke, that I remember years ago when I was traveling down a road, and um, this was when we started a church over in Paulding County, and I had an 81 Ford Courier, and it couldn't pass emissions. And, um, and so I didn't drive it during the week, but I did drive it on Sunday mornings. I was a preacher. I was starting a church, and I didn't have any other way to get all the stuff that we set up on Sunday mornings. So at 5 15 every Sunday morning I had all this stuff loaded up I'd get in the truck and I'd go down I'd go up highway 92 turn left and go to a school where we were starting the church and one Sunday I was loaded up and I was headed to the school on highway 92 and a sheriff pulled me over and when that sheriff pulled me over um, you know I knew I was a dead duck and he asked me obviously for my license and I showed him he said you know why I pulled you over I said yes sir I think I do and um, and so he said well where are you headed and I said well I'm gonna have to tell you the story uh, I'm a preacher, and um, I'm headed to the school where we're trying to start a church, and I didn't have any other way to carry all the stuff, and so I had to load it up in his truck. I don't drive it all week, but I do drive it on Sunday mornings. And I, I've shared with you before, or at least most of you, I've said, you know, at that point, I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, he said, well, Pastor, he said, what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to make sure that I'm not driving down Highway 92 on Sunday morning. And I thought, well, you know what? He didn't, he, you know what he did? He didn't. He didn't deal with my sin the way he probably should have. He really just covered my sin. Now, he didn't cleanse it, but he did cover it. He didn't take that awful gnawing feeling that I had every Sunday morning that I was knowing that I was wrong, trying to justify to myself that I could do that because I was starting a church. He didn't cleanse me of that. And that's really the problem with sin is until we take it to God and we turn it over to God and allow ourselves to experience the forgiveness of God, sin is just going to keep staining our lives until we do something about that stain. And that's what David was doing. He not only wanted to appeal to the mercy of God and confess his sin before the face of God, he wanted to be cleansed by God. He wanted to get rid of that awful gnawing feeling inside of him and wipe his slate clean. And so look at what he did in verse 6 through 10. Listen to the words that he used for Four times, four different ways he cries out for God's cleansing. Here's what he says. In verse 7, he says, purge me, purify me, wash me, O God. Verse 9, blot out my sin, literally take it away. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. He didn't want to be just covered by the grace of God. He wanted to be cleansed by the grace of God. Well, how do you do that? Well, you've got to let him do more than hear you. You've got to. You got to let him help you. Now, how do you do that? Well, the Bible says if we'll confess our sins and repent of our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and to, to cleanse us, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, how does he do that? Well, you know what he does? He's got these word pictures in the Bible that's phenomenal, and they show you the sufficiency of the cleansing of God. You know what he does? First of all, he blots out our sin. That goes back to the days where ink had no acid in it, and so you could literally take a rag, almost like when you're writing on a whiteboard today with those, those non-permanent markers. It didn't have any ink in it, and so you could literally go to that papyrus, and you could take a cloth, and you could just wipe that right off, just blot it right off, and there was a clean piece of paper or papyrus to write on. And that's what he was saying. He was saying, look, 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 God, if you will, just blot out my sin. Just give me a clean slate to start again. He, he said, blot out my sin. But not only does God blot out our sin, you know what else he does? He casts our sin behind his back. Now, if something's behind your back, it's out of reach. And so it's not out of sight. It's not something that you see. It's not something that you can get. And so he casts, the Bible says, his, our sins 
behind his back, behind our back. He blots out our sin. He casts our sins behind our back. Not only that, but he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west, from us. Now, if you're going north, you're going to transverse a pole, and you're going to end up going south, and then you're going to go north. But going east and west, there is no pole to transverse. So if you start going east, you're going to always go east. Now, how far is the east from the west? (laughs) Go figure. I don't know. And that's the point. It's eternal. It never ends. And that's what God does with our sin when we come to him and we confess our sin. He cleanses us. He doesn't just cover us. He cleanses us. He wipes it out. He blots it out. He casts our sin behind our back. He separates us as far as uh, from our sin as far as the east is from the west, which is eternal. They never bump into each other. And he casts our sins into the depths of the sea. That simply means that if he casts our sins into the depths of the sea, he never goes fishing for them again. And so to be cleansed, You've got to let God do the cleansing, and you and I have got to do the accepting. You've got to let your emotions rise to that level of truth. And that's the problem for so many of us, and we're challenged by Satan knows if he can't keep you and me from becoming a Christian, he's going to work to try to keep you from being a good one. And so he messes with our minds, and he tries to get us to believe the feeling that we're not clean rather than the fact that we have been forgiven. And let me tell you something about the forgiveness of God. It is all sufficient. When God cleanses you, it's like Swindoll used to say, when God forgives, he forgets the past ended one second ago. It is sufficient. The cleansing of God is that incredibly powerful. And when you have that kind of cleansing, God says, that's the way back to me. If you've drifted, if you've moved away, If you've gone away from me and you've done those things that you've let separate you from me, there is a way back. Appeal to the mercy of God. Confess your sins before the face of God and avail yourself to the cleansing of God. And then you go over there to Psalm chapter 32, which is the sequel to Psalm 51. The very first verse that David writes, he starts off by saying this. How blessed is the man whose sin has been forgiven. There's a man who had found his way back to God. He had left him. He had drifted. God had never left him. He had left God by the decisions that he made. And that's what F.W. Borham used to say. We make our decisions and then our decisions turn around and make us. So what are the decisions that you've made that have pulled you away from God? Maybe you, maybe you grew distant from his church or from his people. Maybe you grew distant from picking up the Bible ever and reading it or studying it or listening to it. Maybe you've just gone your own way and you've put yourself around the wrong crowd to do your own thing. What is it that caused that distance between you and God? What is it that has created that drifting from you and God? Well, God says no matter where you are today, if you are that prodigal in the far country, there is a way back to the Father. And that song says it best, he is a good, good father. There's a way back. You can have that kind of intimacy and connection with him every day. You can restore the joy of your salvation. How do you deal with it effectively, your sin and your drifting? Appeal to the mercy of God. Repent and confess your sins before the face of God. And and accept the cleansing of God. And that's all you can do, and God will take care of the rest. So if you've messed up, bring your guilt and your shame and your sin to God this morning. Let's stand for prayer. Every eye closed. No one looking around. Every eye closed. Maybe it's you. Maybe that is you this morning, and you know it. Maybe you've been unwilling to admit it, to acknowledge it, to call it what it is, to call it sin. And so today, the reminder from the Bible, from the Word of God, as we continue through this message of intimacy with the Almighty, it is the message of there's hope, there's grace. That's the good news of the gospel, that no matter how many ways you've blown it, there's redemption, there's grace. And so maybe that's you, and maybe, you, maybe you've been sitting in church, just like we, 
talked about this morning in our baptism with Billy. Maybe you've sat in church all of your life. And somewhere along the way you took a preacher's hand or you joined a church. Or you filled out a card or you walked an aisle. Or, or maybe you even taught a class and you said, man, alive, I've done all the things necessary in order to work my way into heaven. I've done good things and I'm a good person. And the only problem with all of that is that you have no relationship with Jesus and so you will split hell wide open by simple default if you never ever accept him as your savior. And so maybe this morning it's you that you, you, you think think somewhere along the way you did something good for God but you never asked him to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of your sin and to give you a relationship with Jesus so today if it's you if you know you're saved but you know you've drifted away and you're a distance from God come back to him like the prodigal son come back to the father the father will meet you as you return He's waiting for you and has been for a long time. But maybe you've never, ever been saved. Maybe you would say, today I know the fact I've never, ever had and established a personal relationship with you. If that's the case, then you come today. God wants to meet you where you are. You come. You say, I want to acknowledge my sin before God. I want to accept him on the basis of faith as my Lord and Savior, believing that he died on Calvary's cross for me. He paid the price for my sins. And he not only died, but he was resurrected. And today he lives making intercession for me as my intermediary. I want him to be my Savior and my Lord and give me the assurance of heaven with him. Whatever it is, though, the Holy Spirit of God meets you here today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you know every heart, you know every need, you know every condition and circumstance of life. And my prayer in these moments, God, is that your Holy Spirit will have free reign in our lives. God, we come against Satan and all that he would try to do to thwart what you want to do in these moments. And God, in Jesus' name, we pray that there would be no binding or that there would be no restricting in individual hearts from what you say and what you want to do in our lives. God, we make ourselves available to you. We want to be wholly abandoned to you.